It's hard to believe that an algorithm can sink a battleship, but according to some reports at least, Jane Fawcett decoded the message that led to the discovery of the destination of the battleship Bismarck in World War II, which was consequently crippled by swordfish biplanes and ultimately sunk by the British Navy. To be fair, other reports, such as the book Enigma by Hugh Seabag Montefiore, suggest that the British Navy had already deduced Bismarck's destination and the Enigma intercept only confirmed it. The point is that understanding how algorithms work is hugely important. I would argue more important than knowing how it's implemented, which is why I'm going over the algorithms first, implementation second. In this video, I plan to go over the algorithm behind the Walshman Diagonal Board. After that, we'll look at the actual implementation of the bomb, and then in the next video, I'll tie it all together with the wiring of the diagonal board connected to the bomb. In the last video, we saw that generating a diagram of the mapping between the crib or guest piece of text and the ciphertext led to the discovery of these loops. When we unroll these loops, we can see that nearly all of the plug board settings cancel each other out, and we can use this to search for possible rotor settings that infer the plug board settings associated with this potential solution. The problem is, this happens to be a particularly good crib and rotor setting combination. It yields multiple loops or closures, so we have plenty to work with, but that's not always the case. Now, I'm going to try the same crib again, Veta for Saga Biscaya, or Weather Forecast for Biscay, but this time I'm going to encode it with different rotor settings and a different plug board mapping compared to the last video. I'm going to use the plug board mappings YV, GT, OQ, WN, FI, SK, LD, RP, MZ, and BU. And I'll start with initial rotor settings of JIY. This means Veta Vosaga Biscaya maps to RASWR, PPWLO, WUDBB, YEVIC, FTQ. We go through the process again of creating a menu. This captures the connection between any given plain text character and the cipher text it generates. We also need to map the rotor position where this occurred. Now, I can see a few loops here. EABE, EYT, SIV, PRE, and there are two inner loops, EYTWE and EWRE. I could use these two inner loops, but let's say I only had access to this EYTWRE loop, giving me three loops in total. I'll make E the key character because it's involved in all the closure loops. Let's see how the bomb goes with just these three loops. I'll enter these closure loops into our code, and we get 21 solutions, which is about what we'd expect from three closures. We can indeed see our true solution, where the rotor settings JIY and E maps to E on the plug board. Remember, we're searching through 26 by 26 by 26 possible rotor settings, and we have to search for our key letter plug board mapping pair, which is another 26 letters. Then there's a 1 in 26 chance of a random match from our first loop, 1 in 26 chance for our second loop, times 1 in 26 chance for the third loop, leading to 26 possible random solutions and our one true solution. But there is an easy way to isolate our one true solution. The first potential solution is AUQ, where E maps to C. The rotor settings for the three closure loops are CPUC, hmm, coincidence, COAVSC, and COAD CDTSC. Let's start by matching up the CPU C loop with the EABE closure loop. OK, so C maps to E, P maps to A, U maps to B, and C maps to E. So far, so good. Let's try our second loop, COAVSC. E maps to C, yep, that's the same. Y maps to O, that's new, but there's nothing wrong with that at this stage. But look here. A maps to T. We know from our previous closure loop that A maps to P. This is a contradiction given that the plug board mappings remain the same for the whole message. 
How can A map to P and also map to T? Well, it can't. This is a false solution. The rest of the second closure loop looks okay so far, but let's look at the third closure loop. A maps to T, that's a contradiction we've already seen. But now T maps to S in this loop, but S maps to R in this loop, and we don't know what's going on with T. C maps to I, but we've already mapped C to E. T and V here is inconsistent with the V and W here. Finally, T mapping to P is just wrong. For this setting, A, U, Q, and C, while the three rotor closures start and end with the same letter, its inferred plugboard mappings are inconsistent. Now let's have a look at the correct answer with rotor settings of J, I, Y, and E maps to E. At the rotors, this generates E, A, U, E, E, V, G, N, P, E, E, V, G, K, F, Y, R, P, E. We see all the closure loops starting in with E, so that's correct. E maps to E, A maps to A, B maps to U, Y maps to V, T maps to G, W maps to N, and R maps to P. In the final loop, S maps to K, and I maps to F, and that's it. There are absolutely no conflicts between any of the mappings. So this gives us another rule we might be able to exploit without knowing all the plugboard settings before we start. Remember that it's the plugboard mappings that really blow out the number of possible settings for the Enigma. Constraint 1, the start and end letter for all the closures must be the same. This is how the basic bomb worked. But now I'm going to add a second constraint. The inferred plugboard mappings must be consistent within a closure loop and also between the various closure loops. This is how the enhanced bomb worked. We know that the true solution must satisfy both these constraints. Adding in this second constraint was the idea of Gordon Mulchman. In the movie The Imitation Game, it was suggested that Hugh Alexander invented it, but it was in fact implemented as a diagonal board invented by Gordon Mulchman. For his 1982 book, The Hut Six Story, which is one of the only first-hand accounts of the incredible work of the Bletchley Park team, he did get into quite a bit of trouble for publishing. The implementation is called the diagonal board, but from an algorithmic perspective, it's hard to understand the name. But from an implementation perspective, it's pretty obvious. We'll get to that later. Before we worry about the implementation, let's see if we can understand the algorithm by adding it to our software emulator. I'm going to add this one dimensional character array, which tells us what any given character maps to on the plug board. I'm going to set up this global variable called conflict detected. For each possible new rotor setting and key character mapping, I call a routine called clear diagonal. This sets each character mapping to be minus one and sets conflict detected to be false. The next thing I need is another two dimensional character array which stores the characters in my closure loop. Again, this is obtained directly from the menu. Now, what I need is another subroutine that tries to add a new plugboard mapping. A and B represent the letters of the new mapping that I want to add. If both A and B are unused, meaning that both are less than zero, i.e. minus one, then I just go ahead and add in the new mapping. The mapping for letter A in the array is set to the value of B, and similarly, the mapping for letter B in the array is set to the value of A. A maps to B, and B maps to A. But, if either of these positions is already occupied, we test to see that A maps to B and B maps to A. If they do, then we return from the routine, we're just trying to add a pairing that's already there. But if either letter has something else in it already, then we've hit a conflict and we set conflict detected to be true. Then, for each input to the rotor, we try to generate a mapping between the character being tested and the mapping we know it should have based on the data from our menu. Finally, to print the output solution, we have to check that all the start and end letters matched and we also need to check that no plugboard conflicts were detected. That's pretty much all it. Let's see if it works. This is the same menu, but this time we've eliminated the 20 other possible solutions and we're left with our one true solution. It means that of all the possible settings, this one is the only one where the start and end letters of the closures are all the same and there's no conflicting mapping in the inferred plugboard settings. It's suggested that a bomb with a Walshman diagonal board generally required one or two fewer closure loops than a basic bomb alone. This meant shorter cribs and less chance that the second rotor would rotate during the crib, which completely destroys the menu.
This algorithm should pick up all plug board mapping contradictions, but the diagonal board will miss some, particularly if the contradiction occurs in a letter not within one of the loops. That said, we only really need one contradiction to reject any given rotor setting. I'm going to shift gears a little here. By now, we know the algorithm for the bomb with the Welshman diagonal board. Basically, we look for multiple loops in the mapping from plain text to cipher text. Within these loops, the plug board mappings for the interior connections cancel out. Next, we check to see that the inferred plug board mappings for a given rotor setting and key letter mapping don't contradict each other, either within a loop or between the loops. This leads to a possible solution, if we can accurately guess the crib and its location. So let's figure out how the actual bomb machine worked. If you want to read a definitive published source on how the bomb worked, I'd recommend this paper titled The Bomb, A Remarkable Logic Machine by Donald Davies, published in Cryptologia in 1999. We know that the rotor selection was done by hand by humans. There was a whole methodology for guessing the rotors used on a particular day, and apparently Hugh Alexander was the best at predicting this. Every step in the software simulation was done sequentially, which is why we ended up with six deep nested for loops. Not such a problem with today's hardware, but not really solvable back in the early 1940s. Now, the bomb went through 26 by 26 by 26 rotor settings sequentially by mechanically rotating the drums. This is what we see happening here. Each one goes from AAA to ZZZ, and this really represents the state of the machine. In earlier versions of the machine, the top bomb rotors would spin at 65 revolutions per minute, where each revolution tested 26 letters, so about 1690 settings per minute. To go through all 17,576 settings took about 10.4 minutes. If we go back to this table, we see that searching for the key character plug board mapping was done in parallel, as was assessing multiple closure loops and all the letters contained within a closure. There's something I want to go over quickly now. We know that the Enigma advances the rotors before displaying a letter on the plug board. So, if we set the rotors to RIC and press a key, assuming that only the right rotor rotates, that key press is actually encoded or decoded with the rotor settings of RID. We need to keep this fact in mind for the next section, or else it'll be a little difficult to follow. Let's start by looking at how multiple letters within a closure were processed. Take EAB for example. What we do is have three sets of rotors running in parallel, all offset slightly differently. We would start the run at ZZZ, and so the first position tested was AAA. According to the menu, we have rotors offset by 1, 13, and 16 relative to ZZZ, so we'd set this first rotor to AAA, the second one to AAM, and the third one to AAP. Because we had three sets of rotors operating in parallel, all we had to do was connect the output of the first rotor offset by 1 to the input of the second rotor, which is offset by 13. The output of the second rotor goes to the inputs of the third rotor, which is offset by 16. The connection between these rotors is done with physical wires, but this presents us with a bit of a problem. We know that for the original Enigma, we had 26 wires connecting the rotors to the plug board. Instead of using a binary representation for each letter, it used one's hot for the input and one's hot for the output. An input voltage was applied to one wire, it would run through the rotors in one direction, hit the reflector board, then find a path back through the rotors, and this voltage would be detectable on another wire within the same bundle. Problem is, the input and output character on the same bundle of 26 wires. But we need the inputs and outputs on different bundles of wires, because the inputs and outputs are connected to different rotors. The solution used in the bomb was to actually replicate the three rotors in each scrambler, which is the term Davies used to describe a set of rotors. A signal comes in the left, passes through rotors 3, 2, and 1. The reflector board no longer reflects, but modifies and passes through the signal, acting more like a fixed rotor. This signal goes into a second set of rotors, configured as rotors 1, 2, and 3, and into the output. What we've done is replicate all the rotors so that we can unravel the input and output from the one bundle. Now, the left-hand copy of rotor 1 is in exactly the same position as the right-hand copy of rotor 1. Similarly, the two copies of rotor 2 have the same setting relative to each other. And finally, the position setting for rotor 3s will be the same as well. Based on this, someone had the brilliant idea of putting both copies of rotor 3, for example, on the same drum. I'm not sure whether this was the Polish team or Alan Turing, 
Anyway, each SRAM in the BOM contained two identical mappings for the same rotor. The inner set of contacts represents one rotor, and the outer set of contacts represents an identical copy of the same rotor. Because they are on the same drum, with the same axle of rotation, this pair of rotors would always move in lockstep. This was essential to allow the output of one set of rotors to be connected to the input of another set of rotors. And this is how the letters within a closure were computed in parallel, with multiple rotor sets all offset from the start position according to the menu. A voltage on the left would instantaneously appear on one wire on the right bundle. For a potentially correct solution, the letters would match. If the letters didn't match, then this rotor setting didn't generate this closure and we knew that this given rotor setting wasn't a potential solution. Hopefully this is clear. Okay, now the last thing I want to look at in this video is how the key character mapping search is done in parallel. We know that the bomb is performing a 26 by 26 by 26 by 26 search because it produced four independent characters from A to Z. Three are for the rotor setting and one for the key character match. This is quite a source of confusion because the rotation of the drums in the bomb only searches 26 by 26 by 26 settings. So how's this last factor of 26 discovered? Well, what the bomb did is it would connect the output from the right rotors back to the input of the left rotors. This connection is our key character mapping for E in this case, and each wire represents a hypothesis for a given mapping. In this case, we know that E is the correct answer. If we apply a voltage to E in this key mapping, it'll come out as E, feed back to the input, and the voltage will be contained to this one pathway through the rotors. There should be no detectable voltage on any other wires. You might be thinking, okay, but don't we still need to sequentially test each hypothesis wire? Well, the answer is no, and here's why. Let's say we apply a voltage to a hypothetical mapping of E to A. A runs through the rotors and comes out as, say, Q. This Q feeds back, goes into the rotors again, and comes out as M. This M feeds back to the input, goes through the rotors again, comes out as a Y. Now this continues on, and the voltage spreads to other letters. And if all goes well, it'll spread to all letters but E. Why not E? Well, we know that the input E is uniquely wired to the output E and no other input. So a voltage on other hypothesis letters, i.e. A, B, C, D, etc., should ever spread the voltage to E. This E pathway is independent from all other pathway connections running through the machine. So it doesn't actually matter which wire you apply voltage to. If we guess correctly and applied voltage to E, then E will be the only wire with voltage. If we applied voltage to some other wire, say A, then all wires except E will carry the voltage. If we see a single wire with voltage, then that's the answer. If we see a single wire without voltage, then that's the answer. But what if our rotor settings were wrong and there were no closure loops? Well, if we apply voltage to any hypothesis wire, it'll rapidly spread to all other wires. And by rapidly, I mean at the speed of light, and all 26 wires will carry the voltage. If we see one wire with voltage, we have a possible solution and should stop. If we see 25 out of 26 wires with a voltage, we have a potential solution and should stop. But if all 26 wires have a voltage, then this is an invalid setting and we should continue. How do we detect if all 26 wires carry a voltage? Well, each hypothesis wire in our key character mapping was connected to a fast telegraph relay. The switch side of the relays are all connected in series, and voltage is applied to the common switch contact of the leftmost relay. If only one relay is energised, say the E relay of our key character, the voltage on the left would stop at the first A relay, that is, there would be no continue signal and the machine would stop. If all the relays but E were energised, then the signal would stop at E and again the machine would stop. But if all hypothesis wires of the key character carried a voltage, then all relays would be energised and the voltage would get through to the continue signal and the machine would move on to the next rotor setting. There's a bit more to it because the machine couldn't stop on a dime, but in principle this is how it worked. All possible 26 hypothesis wires were effectively tested in parallel, and this is how the machine searched for the plugboard mapping for the key character. Very clever. This worked pretty well, but it did have a major problem that can introduce false stops. Let me know in the comments if you can figure out why. This problem was significantly improved by the Walshman Diagonal Board, but I think I'll save that discussion for the next video.